The Mishnah in Pirkei Avos tells us what we actually already know, that there were ten generations from Adam to Noach and ten from Noach to Abraham. But what the Mishnah adds is that the ten generations before Noach show us how compassionate and long-suffering Hashem is. The ten generations from Noach to Abraham was that Abraham should come along and take all of their reward. So something doesn't add up. Why didn't Noach get the reward of the generations that sinned before him? And some people will tell you that that's because Noach didn't daven for his generation. That's fine. So then Avraham should get their reward. And that's, of course, there's something that we don't understand over here, that some generations, for whatever reason, don't seem to have reward. And maybe the mission is, in fact, telling us not just about history, but about our lives, that there are two states of our own lives in terms of our spiritual development and our spiritual challenges. The Mishnah tells us that there were ten generations from Noach to Avram, to show us how compassionate and how patient Hashem is. All of those generations angered Hashem, and Hashem waited patiently until Avram Avinu came and took all of their reward. So we need to understand. If it's true that these generations caused so much havoc, as the Mishnah tells us, obvious question. It says Avram Avinu got their reward. Why would they have reward if they were bad people who rebelled? Beyond that, the Elba Mishnah Nemer in the same Mishnah earlier it says that Asaradarius me Adam ve Adnoyach Lohidia Kama Erech Apoim Lefona. Look at what the previous part of the Mishnah said, that there were ten generations from Adam to Noach, again to show us how patient Hashem is. All of these generations angered Hashem and he let it go and he let it go until eventually he brought the flood against them. Doesn't say anything about Noach getting their reward that there was owing to them that had an address or no address and Noach should have taken it. Actually, the first part of the Mishnah makes more sense. This is the logical part. If they were such bad people, such rebels, they did not deserve any reward. So then it makes sense that Noach didn't have anything to take from them. But that only strengthens the question about Avram Avinu. Doesn't add up. If you want to tell me that the generations between Adam and Noach were so bad that there was no reward for Noach to take, that's logical. But now you tell me that the generations from Noach to Avram, who were probably as bad, there's reward for Avram Avinu to get? How does that work? So yes, Mepharshim, a number of the commentaries point out, and you'll see this in Rashi, Rabbi Noyoyna, and others on the Mishnah Pritya, they say every single person is allocated a portion in Gan Eden right at the beginning of your life. And then, if a person misbehaves, at a person now trades their potential position in Gan Eden and instead now earns a place in the other location, then should somebody else appear on the scene who really deserves a tremendous amount of reward, like Noach or certainly Avram Avinu, that individual gets to take the unallocated Gan Eden. So there was a portion of Gan Eden for these guys. They lost it because of their bad behavior. Somebody comes out who's outstanding. They get the reward that belonged to somebody else. Okay, so that would also be logical. Avraham Avinu was such a spectacular human being, so he gets the reward that his generation and the preceding generations had lost. Beautiful answer, but it doesn't answer the question completely. Because Avodah if that's the case, let's go back to the beginning of the Mishnah. There were ten generations from Adam to Noach. Seeing as they also lost their portion in Gan Eden because they angered God. And Noach was the tzaddik of the time. Surely, Surely Noach should have gotten not only his portion in Gan Eden, but theirs as well. So again, it's, it doesn't seem to add up. Why does Avraham Avinu, yes, get the schar, and Noach doesn't? So the Mephoshim again try to answer. Al-Kach Viru HaMephoshim, Kemesh HaNoyach Lo Hispalol Anshei Doiroi. 
seeing as we know that Noach did not daven to try and save his generation. And he didn't put in any exceptional effort, as we learned in the previous Noyach Sicha. He didn't put in any exceptional effort to try and get them back on board. He just did what Hashem instructed. So therefore, Noyach didn't reach the point where he deserved what they had lost. Mashenken Avram, contrast that with Avram Avinu. Shapir Samilakusa Beoilam went on a public campaign of teaching about Hashem, as the Pasuk says, Vaikra Shom Hashem Hashem Keloilam, and the Gemara famously tells us it doesn't just mean that he called out in Hashem's name, but Vayakri, he caused other people to call in Hashem's name. Vikirib Mne Odom Lakodish Borhu. And he drew people close to Hashem, Kedivri Chazal al Pasuk, as Chazal interpreted the Pasuk that says, Vesa Nefesh Asher Osu B'Choron, the souls that they made, he and Sarah made in Choron, which is effectively the people they drew close to the Shechina. So because Avram Avin was so much more spiritually proactive, Zohar Lefichach Lekabel Schar Kulam, he deserved not only his own personal reward, but also the reward that previously had been allocated to the rest of those generations. Okay, so apparently we have an answer. Noach was not of the spiritual caliber of Avram Avinu, so the unallocated schar of his generation was not given to him. Okay, so give it to Avram Avinu then. Rashadayin still isn't clear. If we go with the premise that every person is allocated Gan Eden at the beginning of their life, and if they lose it, it gets reallocated to somebody else who deserves it, that means that there are ten generations from Adam to Noach of unallocated Gan Eden. Because everybody starts off with a piece of Gan Eden, as we said. If Noach didn't get their reward, then it remains floating around in limbo. Because he didn't deserve to get their reward. So who did? The Commissioner doesn't tell us that Avram Avinu got it. The Mishnah tells us Avram Avinu got the reward of the generations post Noach. So who received the, the reward that was allocated to the generations up to Noach? It would be a little far-fetched to say it's still in limbo. That reward went nowhere. Because when we were introduced to Gan Eden at the beginning of the Torah, we were told that Adam Arishan had a responsibility to work in and guard Gan Eden. Which means that at that time, that was the space, that was the habitat of humans. Once the Chet HaTzadas happened and humans were expelled from Gan Eden, Gan Eden doesn't lose its purpose now. Gan Eden retains its position and its job. Le'ovdo Shamra is no longer done, so to speak, by Adam Harishan to service or to guard Gan Eden. Instead, Gan Eden becomes the destination or the reward for those who Le'ovdo, who serve Hashem through positive mitzvahs in this world, or Shamra, those who guard against the negative mitzvahs in this world. So Gan Eden has a purpose. Its purpose is to service those of us who deserve entry to Gan Eden. I know. She Gan Eden no'ad le'odam. Gan Eden was destined for humans originally as a habitat and subsequently as a soul habitat. Gan Eden has a very specific purpose. So it's illogical then to say there are going to be certain chambers, areas or suburbs in Gan Eden that are left empty because the people who had originally been allocated that space never got there. So now it sits as uh, vacant tenants, you know, vacant properties. Doesn't make sense. Especially when you consider that here we're proposing that there are sections that belong to entire generations, generations who lived for extremely long times. In other words, they could have achieved a lot, so there must have been a lot of potential Gan Eden for them. And now it's sitting empty? Logic would say, if that allocation of Gan Eden exists, massive tracts of Gan Eden waiting, somebody has to get them. Unless, unless you have no alternative but to conclude,
The only alternative would be to suggest that those 10 generations from Adam until Noach had never been allocated space in Gan Eden. Quite a surprising thought. Avot Tzorech Lehoven would then have to understand What could have been so devastatingly bad about those 10 generations that they're even worse than the 10 angering, rebellious generations who followed that they don't even deserve a place in Gan Eden. What's going on over here? Gam Eine Moven. Something else we have to understand, which actually if you think about it is it's an, such an obvious question. We should have asked it. Do I need a Mishnah to t- teach me that Hashem is patient? What's the Mishnah innovating by saying Hashem is so incredibly patient? It's a clear verse in the Torah that Hashem is kel erech apayim. That Hashem is incredibly patient and not only with the good guys. Rashi tells us there was this whole interesting interaction between Hashem and Moshe Rabbeinu, where Moshe Rabbeinu felt that Hashem's patience should be reserved only for good people. And Hashem says, no, Afli Rishoim, he is eternally patient even with the wicked. So I need a Mishnah now to tell me that Hashem is so patient? So the Pasha says, Yeshleim HaShachidish Mishnah Hu, Kama Erech HaPayim Chulei. So I suppose what the Mishnah then must be teaching us is not the principle that Hashem is patient, but rather the extent to which Hashem is patient, because that's not stated in the Pasuk. The Pasuk doesn't give us the span, the extent of Hashem's patience. It just says Hashem is incredibly patient. That's why this Mishnah comes along to say, let me tell you how patient. The Chiddush of this Mishnah is that Hashem's patience will extend even to 10 generations down the line. Okay, beautiful insight, and we really are encouraged by that. But why is that the number? That itself has to be explained. What is the logical explanation that Hashem would extend His patience to 10 generations? What's the symbolism of 10 generations? Why is that relevant to the conversation? Just say that Hashem is exceptionally patient. Why 10 generations? So we even call Zeh Bagdomas Abir Be'inyan Noisof. In order to understand all of this, we have to ask one other question, and that is this fifth chapter of Pirkei Avos speaks about a whole lot of things that are in tens. But the order, and the order in Mishnah is always very precise, the order in which the Mishnah goes through these things is not purely chronological, which means there has to be another motivation behind the order. What do I mean? Let's see. Not only are the words within a Mishnah very precise, but the order in which things are presented in a Mishnah is always precise. Therefore, therefore, when you find the order of certain Mishnahs in the same chapter, the way that they are ordered is very carefully chosen. In which case, we have to ask this question. What's the link between our Mishnah that talks about the ten, ten generations from Adam to Noach, and then, of course, the ten from Noach to Avram, but the Mishnah that says ten generations from Adam to Noach, how does that link to the preceding Mishnah, which is that Hashem created the world with ten statements, ten utterances? If you're going to say, well, obviously, you just started talking about creation of the world, and this is the next thing that happened, the first ten generations, that's not a good enough answer. If you're arguing that it's because these ten generations began straight after creation, that's still not a good enough answer. Why? Because there's a Mishnah still to come which belongs chronologically before this one. Which Mishnah? The mission that talks about the ten things that were created at twilight on Friday going into Shabbos. Because that's talking about the end of the creation process, which is of course before the ten generations. So that doesn't work. The flow doesn't work. It's like we've skipped the chronology. 
start talking about creation, then talk about the generations, and then come back to the final blows of creation. Doesn't make sense. There's got to be another reason to connect them. What's that reason? The previous mission did not simply tell us that Hashem created the world using ten utterances. It extracted a lesson out of that. It said, It said that that teaches us a double lesson. Number one, To expand the degree to which Hashem will take issue with and therefore meet out consequences to bad people who destroy the world. It's almost as if Hashem is saying, I invested more than I needed to into the world. Therefore, it's more of an issue if you corrupt my world. And the second lesson retains, Likewise, Hashem says, I invested extra into my world. So those good individuals, righteous individuals, who maintain and sustain my world, they deserve a whole lot more. So now that we're thinking along the lines of that Mishnah, where the nature of creation addresses two types of people, that it tells us about the devastation that we meted out to the bad people who destroy the world, and the greatness that will be given to those pious individuals who uphold the world, that leads directly into the second Mishnah, which picks up on that theme. Good people who sustain the world get more. Bad people who destroy the world lose out. And that's the flow in this next Mishnah. Because look at how this next Mishnah goes. Aleph tells us, That there were ten generations from Adam to Noach. That first part of this Mishnah links directly to the first example that was given in the previous Mishnah. Bad people who destroy the world and therefore they deserve devastation of their own. In line with what the first Mishnah said, bad people who destroy the world will be destroyed. They were destroyed through a flood. Second point. First mission in its second point said, and the tzaddikim get much more from Hashem. The second part of our mission now says, and there were ten generations from Noach to Avram Avinu, who all angered Hashem, and then Avram Avinu came, he sustained the world, and he got all of their reward. Even though these generations, like the ten before them, did all kinds of destruction, destructive acts in the world, Still, in Avram Avinu Kiyam Esa'olam, they had a unique individual emerge at the tail end of their time. Avram Avinu, who sustained and solidified Hashem's world. Avram Avinu's power was such that he even brought stability to the ten generations in which he lived or after which he lived. Meaning to say, they were not completely destroyed like the first ten generations where they were destroyed and their reward in Gan Eden, everything was destroyed. There was nothing left. In Avram Avinu's time, he stabilized the world to such a point that whatever reward was potentially originally allocated to these ten generations, so they lost their reward, but the reward wasn't lost. It remained available and he came and scooped it up and took it aligned with what the Mishnah says. Anybody who keeps the world will get schar, tremendous reward from Hashem. Okay, so that tells us maybe about the greatness of Avram Avinu. It doesn't yet distinguish between these two sets of ten generations. So let's still try and understand what is the fundamental difference between what's clearly two periods a 10 generation period from Adam to Noach and a different 10 generation period from Noach to Avram Avinu. So, what is the difference? Why is it that the second period of 10 generations was open to the possibility of being stabilized and saved and having their reward retained and redirected and not the first? So the explanation works this way. If you have a look at the history of Jewish wars, certain times there was 
uh, loot. There was the spoils of war that the Jewish nation was not allowed to touch. They had to destroy. Other times, they were permitted to take the spoils of war. Now, as it is in physical military experience, the same thing happens in the spiritual war that we fought over the course of history. Likewise, the ongoing conflict that we have with the negative of this world, there are again two kinds of negative energy in this world. And if there's two different kinds of energies, that means that there have to be two kinds of tactics that we have to use to fight those two different kinds of energy. Aleph, the first kind of energy, first in the order as presented over here in the Mishnayis. There are in Yonim Shehim Ra, Gomur Vein Bohem Toif Klau. Certain elements of this world are absolute evil and have no hope for redemption. Therefore, the only way to deal with those components of the world that are, so to speak, absolute evil is to destroy them completely. As the expression goes, that if you have a klicheres, for example, um, if you have a, a, an earthenware vessel, the only way to purify it is to smash it completely and reconstitute it again. So this is the principle. How do you purify this segment of the world? By getting rid of it. It's the only way to, to fix it, is to get rid of it, to destroy it, to war against it. There's a fascinating explanation that the Alter Rebbe gives about the Para Aduma and how the Para Aduma exemplifies exactly this principle. When the Alter Rebbe explains in the Kutatari why it is that we have to burn a Para Aduma, it's such a bizarre concept because you search high and low till you find this cow that is completely red and then you burn it. So why is the red even relevant? Says the Alter Rebbe, Shapara Remezes Lemaisim Horoim Shein Beemes Ragomu Mitzad Atzmon. The Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe says this red heifer. We know that red is often the color associated with sin and with gevura. So this Para Aduma represents the evil in the world that has to be eradicated because it cannot be rehabilitated. Velochein Soyfin Esapara. That's why you burn this cow completely. In the Alter Rebbe's words, there is no other way to fix this evil other than to completely obliterate it from our lives. When you burn the para, what happens? All that's left behind is the most basic component, the carbon, the ash of the cow. Which the Alter Rebbe explains, the ash that is left behind, now completely void of color and substance, represents the core of the drive for any kind of pleasure, which is not intrinsically evil. It's just that it tends towards evil temptations. But the, the, the drive to have things that you enjoy is not fundamentally evil. So it's kind of like the, the ash that's left behind. Anyhow, you could study that piece of the Kutatera. It's fascinating. The principle that's relevant to our conversation is there are certain types of energy in this world that are so bad, the only way to deal with them is obliterate them. Secondly, Bayes, then you have in Yolim Shitochen Shibagiloi Loini Rebbein Tov Klau. There are many things that at face value do not seem to have any holy value to them. But if you knew what you were looking for and you had the right equipment, you'd be able to look beyond the surface and detect that there is a spark of holiness within them. So it would be inappropriate to destroy these elements of the world because they have imprisoned sparks of holiness. The correct way for us to engage these parts of the world would be to engage, transform them, and allow them to be sustainable because now you see the good in them. Now you see the holiness in them. Like the Gemara tells the story, in Menoches, the story of a guy who was tempted by a particular prostitute. At the last minute, his tzitzis reminded him not to sin, and that actually inspired her, and she converted and became Jewish, and then went back and ended up marrying him. The Gemara says the same bedspread that she had put out originally with sinful intentions, she now put out with holy intentions. That's it. There was a spark of holiness inside this woman, and 
inadvertently though, but this person was able to spark that flame inside of her and bring out the holiness. That's the goal. This is the fundamental difference between the ten generations Adam to Noach versus the ten generations Noach to Avram. The ten generations from Adam to Noach, whatever bad they had in them, was absolute, unrepentant bad. Bad that cannot be rehabilitated can only destroy the world it lives in. So the only way to deal with them, which is as the Ebishta did, is to eradicate them from the face of the earth through a flood. The only Rehabilitation is destruction for that kind of evil. Whereas the second period, the ten generations from Noach to Avram, in spite of the fact that they also angered Hashem tremendously, yet, Whatever negative lived within those people, it was the style of negative energy that could be saved and converted. Therefore, when Avram Avinu appears on the scene and pumps holiness into the entire world, he was able to sustain the world by fixing and rehabilitating those ten generations, and therefore, he gets all the value. All the value that was hidden inside it and that they themselves could not access, Avram Avinu was able to bring that value to the, to the fore. So that answers our question, the difference between the first and the second sets of 10 generations. What it hasn't yet answered is, why 10? Why is that the magic number? The reason 10 is the so-called maximum of Hashem's patience is because Throughout Hasidus we describe how the number 10 is a number that represents an entire system, wholeness, all the facets, the full spectrum of existence is represented by ten. That's how it is very obviously in the realm of holiness, the ten sephiros, ten powers of the soul, etc. But it's also true in the systems on which negative things run. They are also ten faceted systems. So therefore... Therefore, anything that is negative, its holistic reality is ten facets or ten levels. That's why Hashem is patient. And he waits ten generations to see, will they rehabilitate? Will they do to Shiva? If they don't, then they, so to speak, fill out the full extent of their badness, of their evil, over the course of ten generations. Each generation representing a facet of this negativity. So ten generations means you've now filled to capacity all of the negative that could possibly be produced by these individuals, and now it's time to destroy them. And that's got to have a lesson for us, because the Torah is not just a book of history. It's a book primarily of lessons, personal lessons. So that means that each of us in the creation of our world has segments. We have some parts of our life that are like the first 10 generations, some parts of our lives that are like the second 10 generations. As we well know, the Medrash tells us that each of us is considered a microcosm. So if the whole world history started off with two eons, one of ten generations of absolute evil that had to be destroyed, and one of evil that could be flipped, there's a similar process in our lives. Let's say that a person went for a period of time represented by the number 10, right? So 10 days of being absolutely sunk in negative behavior. And the person turns around and says, listen, I know I'm not doing as I should, but hey, I'm living a good life. Everything's okay. 
הרי יכול הוא לא יסבד את זה שגם לבו יהיה מצב כפי שהיה עד עכשיו. person could fool themselves into thinking, I've lived just fine, no major issues in my life, in spite of the fact I'm not doing what Hashem wants. That's how it's going to be. As the Pasuk says, where the person, so to speak, boasts to themselves and says, hey, life is going to be peaceful for me and I'll do as I please, eat, drink and be merry. Everything's fine. So the Mishnah wags a warning finger at us and says, The fact that a person may have had all kinds of healthy flow of brocha from Hashem in spite of them not deserving it, that's because Hashem is so incredibly patient. Every one of us has a cut-off period. And then Hashem's patience ends and the difficulties chasvashon could begin. Now we could avoid this, right? So we've got to create for ourselves a personal mabul. What's a mabul? Just like the mabul wiped out everything that was negative, every one of us has the choice and the capacity to wipe out whatever's negative in our lives. The truth is that's not enough. It's not just good enough to wipe the slate. Because if a person went through a period of time, the so-called 10 days of negative behavior, it's not just that you were in the wrong space. During that same period of time, you were responsible to do positive things and you didn't do them. The Apostle says, Hashem has created days and you have to dedicate them to Him. We were all given an allocation, a limited allocation of time to dedicate to Hashem, and now there's lost time. That's why we have to then engage in the second type of service of Hashem, represented represented by the second period of ten generations, which is the full kiyum gambi yomim she'ovru. Just like Avram Avinu reached back into ten generations and brought them a sense of meaning, sustainability, and as a result, schar that he then experienced, same for us. Just as Avram Avinu did, we have to convert the negative, the darkness, into positive and light. That way we can actually play catch-up for the days that we lost out, uh, lost out on. To the extent that we could actually catch up and receive all of the reward that had actually belonged to the previous days by playing double, double action, double investment in the now. So in its Hashem, we should play that catch up, and Hashem should give us catch up also all the days of Golas that were so difficult and dark, he should transform into light with the coming of Mashiach now.